is if you have right. an economic system in which pharmaceutical companies benefit hugely from medical emergencies, where a military industrial okay. complex benefits from war, where energy companies benefit from energy crises, you are going to These generate right. states of perpetual crisis. Yes. Professor, Professor Schippers, may I ask you some questions? Yes, of course. What do you want to know, Rico? What I see happening now is windmills appearing everywhere, solar panels appearing in nature, where there used to be green hills with trees are now electrical devices. And we're talking about net zero. These are some examples. I'm going to go to that question. Uh, we, we talk about net zero, what really means stop your creation of, uh, of CO2 as a gas, but you can also um, exchange your pollution, if you call it pollution, with somebody else, resulting in an incentive that has adverse effects. You change nature into, <laughs> into solar panels, which is an adverse effect, if you ask me. What can you tell us about perverse incentives, Michaela? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what is a perverse incentive? It's basically an incentive that you give people, but it has unintended consequences. So, um, uh, for, for instance, well, I'm going to talk about the, 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 the cobra effect, because that was the first time it was documented, I think. Um, and so this was in, in India, where there were um, go, uh, ven venomous uh, uh, cobras, and they wanted to reduce the population of those uh, snakes. So, snakes. Yeah. And they, they, they gave an incentive for people to, to bring the head of a snake, so what, that's what I did in, at first. So it reduced the population, but then they started breeding those uh, um, snakes. Chop off the it, heads and get the money. The exactly. <laughs> um, and, then, um, and then the uh, government thought, oh, this is not what we wanted. So it's an unintended consequence, a perverse incentive. So they skipped the scheme. But then Pe all the people, people were breeding cobras. And they put them in nature. And then there were more cobras than before they had. Sounds like the environmental policies that we're currently undergoing in, uh, and what, what I started with some uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, so there's, there, there are a lot of examples, but there's also a management classic on this topic, and it's called On the Folly of Rewarding A While Hoping for B. So basically governments are hoping for people to change their behavior for, I don't know, for the environment. Uh, and sometimes they choose the wrong uh, tools. Uh, thing, tools to do it, and they are going to incentivize it. So you cannot wonder if, you know, windmills and all those things are better than other solutions. Aren't there any other solutions that are better? So we have seen some examples already, and I'm going to read one, and it's on Wikipedia, so you can also find it yourself. Um, in 2005, uh, the UN Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change began an incentive scheme to cut down on greenhouse gases. Companies disposing of polluting gases were rewarded with carbon credits, which could eventually get converted into cash. Gas. Cash, sorry, cash. The program set prices according to how serious the damage the pollutant could do to the environment and attributed one of the highest bounties for destroying HFC 23, a byproduct of a common coolant, may, some people may remember, a, uh, HCFC 22. As a result, companies started to uh, began to produce more of this coolant in order to destroy more of the byproduct waste gas and collect millions of dollars in credits. This increased production also caused uh, the price of the refrigerant to decrease significantly, motivating, motivating refrigeration companies to continue using it despite the adverse environmental effects. In 2013, credits for the destruction of this uh, gas were suspended in the European Union. So they, they yeah, they keep finding out that this doesn't work or it has adverse consequences because people see the money and they go for it and it has the opposite effect. So and there is another one, it's the renewable heat incentive scandal, commonly referred to as the cash for ash scandal, introduced by the devolved government in Northern Ireland. Um, and that heat incentive um, was a 20-year scheme intended to encourage businesses to reduce energy usage and promote switching to green sources. However, the subsidy for the renewable energy was greater than its cost, which allowed businesses to make profit by switching to green sources and then increasing the energy use rather than reducing it. 
In some cases, an income was obtained simply by heating empty buildings. Exactly. Uh, and the political fallout of this, um, uh, the Northern Ireland executive took a lapse in 2017. It was not reconvened until 2020. So we might have a similar <laughs> problems at the moment. I'm not sure if they did any better because if you incentivize one thing, people will show more of that behavior. If you give money for, for people to do X, they will do X. What I see is some people consider carbon, CO2, as a, as a problem. Well, if you see that as a pollutant, mm -hmm. um, you can't go chopping down trees <laughs> that's, that's, uh, to, to, to replace them with, um, with uh, solar panels, for instance. So I see policies not working wrong incentives, incentives that have the adverse effects. Mm -hmm. How do we es escape that then? How do we change that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe. Well, you're, you're in the department of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you don't have these incentive schemes. That is to begin with, I think. Ah. Um, if you give farmers, uh, I don't know, money to produce a lot of milk, they will produce a lot of milk. Um, yeah. yeah. Th th that's the simplest thing, not, not having these. And if you give an incentive scheme, really think it through. Because um, yeah, in my line of work, we've been seeing for years that uh, academics were um, rewarded for publishing in high-ranked journals. So what did they do? They kind of did less on, on, on educating people and, and giving lectures, which is also a very important task of, uh, of a professor. Have we um, moved out of that already or are we still? Um, we haven't completely moved out of that. Um, so uh, what also happens is that if you teach with the two, uh, two people, then one will say, oh, I will only focus on publishing. I've literally been in a situation like that, that I thought, oh, but we have like 1400 students. How are we going to divide the work? And then I ended up doing all the work myself, which is also not a good deal because that was a lot of work. And then people, the students weren't happy. Nobody was happy in the end. Incentives uh, that we, we call professor incentives are uh, used to change behavior. Yes, the, the, the goal is to change behavior. So the goal was to, to, or, or to, to solve a problem, like in, uh, in India, uh, if we give people uh, an incentive to, to um, yeah, make sure there are less venomous uh, snakes in the city, then they will do it at first. But then they will think, hey, wait, I can also earn some money by just breeding these things. Maybe behavior isn't all that manageable. Maybe mm -hmm. we should be more modest in trying to change behavior through monetary rewards. Uh, rewards. Yeah, and ha have this intrinsic, people have a lot of intrinsic motivations to do things. So uh, let's, let's say with the Great Citizens Movement, we say, okay, let's decide together what is a good idea. And then if there's one person thinking uh, at the top, yeah, he wants to control the people. Uh, usually there's a lot of controlling behavior and they think it's very simple. Just, you know, come up with incentive schemes and it will work. So a solution would be reduce the top-down system that we have currently of people in their ivory tower imposing policies with way too much money at their hands and just let the people come up with solutions. Yeah, I would say a form of direct democracy will work. Um, use the brains of all people. Not everybody has a has the same kind of brain, but also I think together it will give a lot of synergy and also some wisdom of the crowd. Yeah. Probably. Have you said everything you wanted to say about perverse incentives? Michelle? Well, I can talk about this all day because it's it's one of the most pervasive uh, uh, things in society that, like with with windmills, you know, people uh, people can earn a lot of money, uh, but is it really? Um, what I'm starting to, I see these things happen also, and I'm starting to doubt if it's a perverse incentive, like started with um, uh, good intentions, mm -hmm. but have unintention, uh, unintended consequences, like yes. with the Cobras. Yeah. Right now, I'm, I'm beginning to feel that the intentions were good altogether, and the, the scheme was invented for people to make money in the first place. That's hard to say what the original idea was behind it. I'm losing faith in the people starting these policies. Oh, yeah, but that is really important because I wrote, of course, this paper on, on societal demise. And when people start to lose their faith in institutions, that is one of the main markers of societal demise and collapse. This is happening to me when I see people chopping down trees to replace them with solar panels and windmills. Yeah. Let's uh, keep the trees, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this uh, exploration. Welcome.